Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for the record, my name is John Fitzgerald, District 3 City Councilor. I'm the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Public Health, Homelessness, and Recovery. Today is October 10th, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.health at boston.gov, that's G-O-V, and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. I think we're gonna take it at a little bit at the beginning actually on this one. Uh, and individuals will be called on in the order uh, in which they signed up and they will have two minutes to testify. If you're interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. Uh, if you're looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Karishma Chohan, at karishma.chohan at boston.gov. That's K-A-R-I-S-H-M-A dot C-H-O-U-H-A-N at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket number 1001, order for a hearing regarding the LGBTQ plus youth and young adult homelessness in the city of Boston. This matter was sponsored by counselors Henry Santana, Elizabeth Braden, and Gabriela Coletta Zapata, and referred to the committee on June 12th, 2024. Uh, today I'm joined by my colleagues in order of their arrival, uh, Council President Louis Jen, Councilor Santana, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Braden, and Councilor Mejia. Uh, at the risk, we just had a very long, uh, a very long hearing uh, prior to this, and I know that folks have some other uh, events to get to tonight. Uh, so I will allow um, the lead sponsor to have any opening remarks, if he may. But otherwise, if it's all right with the body, we'll just keep moving. Um, so, Council Santana, floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, really appreciate our, our, our panelists for being here um, and to discuss this um, very important um, topic. Um, it's no secret um, that my number one priority on this council has been our youth, um, and it, it covers all aspects. And um, really looking, you know, I really believe that housing is a human right. Another one of my um, top priorities on the council has been um, our housing, and you know, really looking at the housing crisis um, that we have here in the city of Boston. Um, and then um, I've also. Um, being a big, big advocate for our LGBTQ plus community here in the city of Boston. Um, and when we're looking at housing or looking at our most vulnerable um, populations, um, our LGBTQ plus community um, is really hurting in this, in this area. So I really want to be, I really wanted to file this alongside with uh, my co-sponsors. Really grateful for um, Councillor Braden and, 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 and Councillor um, um, Gigi Clara Zapata um, for, for, being, for joining me in this. Um, but I'm, I'm here to listen from, from, our, from our panelists, um, from your lived experience, um, from your expertise, um, and see what we can do here in the city of Boston, on the Boston City Council, um, um, to really, really invest in this issue. And again, everyone, everyone deserves a home, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be fighting for that, especially for our LGBTQ plus community. So I um, really, really appreciate you all being here and your patience on, on you know, I know this was supposed to start at 2, it's 2.42, so I um, really appreciate it and your flexibility. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Santana. Uh, again, I know because uh, this hearing is uh, centered around the youth, and I know some people have taken time off or maybe uh, out of school to be here today. Uh, I would love to make sure that you guys get uh, the first voice. And so, um, in turning it over to testimony, I will remind folks they have two minutes to speak, uh, and then we will uh, uh, move on to the next one. Um, and, and then we'll hear from the first panel and then on to the administration in the second panel, if that sounds good to everybody. So, um, We'll start with you. Could you please just state your name? And, yes. uh, and then two minutes. Thank you so okay. much. Hi, my name is Brianna Minnie. I'm 27 years old and I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, but grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. I've been enrolled in programs all over Boston. Briefly to share a bit about my experience with homelessness. I was adopted at age three and after that I grew up with my adopted mom. I had a broken relationship with her, so DCF had half custody of me. 
I was in and out of group homes since age 12. By the age of 17, I was enrolled in a pre-independent living in Newton, Mass. I signed myself out of DCF custody at age 18, and I was on the streets for years, having to do what I had to do to survive and make money. The cold nights were the worst, especially when you have the cops flashing lights and asking you to leave. Where was I supposed to go? I got pregnant at the age of 20, and I've been in and out of family shelters until the age of 23. During that time, I was at Bridge Over Troubled Waters, and that's how I found out about Break Time. Break Time is a program that takes young adults off the streets and provides them with the resources they need to offer employment for up to three years. After that, shortly after that, within the last couple of years, I got my Section 8. Break Time has given me a lot of resources, helped me get my GED, and I got paid to get my GED through them. I was actually the first young person in the program to have that opportunity. I was the reason they started it when I was pregnant. I'm doing better now with my children, and we have a roof over our heads. And um, homelessness is not a joke. It's a big thing around the whole city. A lot of young people don't get the resources they need. But break time does give you that resources, sorry. And there needs to be more programs like this. It's super important to advocate around the world. Homelessness is one of the biggest issues we have. Economy and inflation are out of this world right now. And it's not right that so many people that once had a life of their own are now bound to the streets. We need to make a difference, and it starts here. Thank you so much for your testimony. Oh, we appreciate it. Sorry. Hi, my name is Abdul Mudalib Hassan. I'm an immigrant. Oh, wait, wait one sec. Is the mic on? Sorry, go ahead. My name is Abdul Mudalib Hassan. I'm an immigrant from Somalia. I came to this country in 2016, and I became homeless in 2021 after I had a physical um, um, with my family. And break time has helped me a lot. Uh, I have uh, a lot of mental issues. I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't you know, worked with me and taught me things like how to speak up. And you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful for them. And I'm thankful for Bridge Over Trouble Water too because they, they were the first people that housed me when I had nowhere to go. So I'm really thankful. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have to list the names. So yes, folks okay. I'm going to go on behalf just, of just, one of the youth who had to step away. Sure. All right. So, um, hi. This is for the youth who had to step away and get back to a meeting. My name is Nova, and I've been a, and I am an LGBTQ um, homeless youth. I can say that staying in Mass has been very different from where I'm from in Tennessee. In Mass, they have a lot more opportunities for homeless for homeless people, and especially LGBTQ. However, when I'm in the youth-based shelters, I don't always, I mean, when I'm not in a youth-based shelter, I don't always feel safe because some of us are coming from different states. We don't really know where we're accepted or where we're not. The shelters that we get directed to are not age-focused or open to for too long. So that leaves us to other shelters with people who are scary and often we are afraid of being hurt or hated, which leads us to feeling hopeless. Some of us end up with suicidal ide ideation or some of us just go through it with our attempts. Some of us just want you to to know that we're not that we're not going to be harmed we just want a safe place where we can sleep and get the rest that we need to be able to look for housing that's it thank you um, hi so uh, my name is Levi I'm from Arkansas and uh, I've been through a lot I left my parents whenever I was 15 because they were abusive I went into foster care and then I've recently left foster care now that I'm 18 to come here because in Arkansas there's a lot of really bad legislation that made everything dangerous for me I couldn't go to college I couldn't go to the store I couldn't do anything without having some sort of something going on and so I you know, whenever I found out that I wasn't going to have any place left to live in Arkansas, I decided, okay, I'm going to spend the last of my money, buy a train ticket to Boston, and I've been here for about a week now, and it's better, but it's still dangerous. It's still scary. I've still slept in a park and woke up very pale and blue one day, and every single morning when I wake up, I don't know if I'm going to have a warm place to sleep tonight, and I don't know if it's going to be in a bed or on a mat in the floor, and whenever I go to walk to bridge in the morning to go find something to eat, I have to pass by um, you know, needles and blades and knives and people I don't know who are safe or not, and the only people I have in my life are people like me, people who want to help but can't even help themselves. And so the thing is, is that it's about the people who can help, can't help. And 
the people, the people who can help don't want to help, and the people who want to help can't. And so if you can help, it's up to every single person, whether they're on this board or in a house, or whether or not homelessness or LGBTQ problems are directly affecting them or not. It's all of our responsibilities as a human race to all treat each other as you know, brothers and sisters like we are, and take care of each other, take personal responsibility for everyone, and that goes for in Boston, for in Arkansas, for all across the world, for every single person. Thank you. Hi, my name's Aaliyah. I'm from California originally, um, and I came out to Boston around like two weeks ago. Um, and through my time in Boston, I've been staying at um, what was supposed to be a woman's only shelter. Um, I only feel comfortable in a woman's only shelter because um, I am a woman. Um, and um, one of the major things that I feel like needs to be emphasized is not only like the ease of getting into the shelters that we need to get into, but also like the safety and how it should be a priority that we should be able to feel safe even if we don't have a home to call our own. Why shouldn't have to feel like I'm gonna be um, harassed for being 19 and in a shelter. I shouldn't feel like I'm going to, um, I can't sleep at night because I don't know if someone's going to try to do anything in the middle of the night in the shelter. And it's like um, a crude thing to have to say in front of all these people, but it's um, a sad truth that needs to be realized, I feel like. And the only time I truly feel like I am safe, I can take a nap, I can close my eyes and not be um, unsafe is in these youth-based shelters where, for example, I say I spend a lot of my time at Bridge when I'm not at the um, women's shelter because I feel safest at Bridge, mainly because it is a youth-based shelter, but also because they have so many like LGBTQ-based um, activities and support systems and people that understand what's happening. I don't think that putting people that don't understand LGBT matters in an LGBT safe space will get us into a position where youth can come in and get the resources they need because at the end of the day you can't preach what you don't know and if you're if you can't sit and run an LGBT based anything when you don't understand the experiences and what it actually means to be LGBT in America but not only to be LGBT in America to be 19 to be LGBT to be a woman and to be black, but also to be homeless, and to not have a place where you can go and you can escape the threats that are on the streets constantly, not even just a person, but also the needles you can walk by and you can get something stuck in your foot and you're done for and you didn't even do anything to add, like you didn't ask for that, you didn't, you're, you're abstaining, you're trying to get away from it. And I think also one of the major things that is really, really difficult is um, like, the accessibility of getting into these shelters. For example, um, a lot of the shelters are not willing to let people in if they're like 18 or 19. They're saying that we're too young to be in these shelters, but they're often the only ones open. Like the 24-hour shelters won't accept sometimes 18-year-olds, which leaves the 18-year-olds sleeping on the street, and now they're open to attackers. Um, I think that that's just not something that's really looked at or touched on. And also, I don't think that anyone should have to be told that they need to be grateful that they even have a place to sleep in the first place, because we don't have to be grateful, because we didn't ask to be in this position. Half of the people that are in this position aren't in this position because of anything that they could have prevented. Um, but yeah, that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if that concludes the, the, the youth testimony, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you, uh, even some of the folks who have just been here just a couple of days or a couple of weeks, uh, to be able to come up here and uh, present in front of this body, to have the courage to do that and tell your story uh, is remarkable and powerful. So thank you for, for taking the time to do that. Um, we'll now turn it over to, uh, I'd now like to introduce today's uh, panelists testifying uh, on behalf of the advocates. Uh, we have, uh, Shapley Brooks, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, Executive Director of Mass Commission on LGBTQ Plus, uh, plus Youth, uh, Connor Scone, Co-Founder and Executive Director of Break Time, Aiden Seguin, Guest Advocacy Director of Y2Y Network, uh, and Eli Perry, Outreach Specialist for Bridge Over Troubled Water. Um, so I turn it over uh, to the panel. Uh, I don't know if you all have uh, any presentation to give or we'll just go down the line uh, and folks can act. 
but um, I turn it over to you all. Yeah. Yeah, I can. I can definitely start. So, having uh, the dual role that I have at. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Again, my name is Eli. Sorry about that. So I have a dual role at Bridge Over Troubled Waters. I am a recovery specialist slash case manager. Um, and I do a lot with outreach, too. Um, that's probably why I was introduced like that. But um, I just want to start with Bridge is a great space for anybody, right? Um, we have clients that come from different sides of the world. We have clients that come from different parts of our country. We have clients that come from different parts of our state. But one thing that remains true for everyone is that when they come to Bridge and they enter the floor that I'm working on is that they feel welcomed, right? Um, when you look at the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, especially the homeless community, um, they and we are not supported in the way that um, there should be support. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we've heard countless clients come up here and say that, you know, it's not my fault that I'm homeless or, um, you know, when I did go to the shelter, I didn't feel welcomed or I didn't feel safe. And that's really up to us who have the power to create these environments and these safe spaces. So I feel like if, if we at Bridge had a little bit more support or resources to extend and open up another shelter or be able to partner and create a, a space where it's just LGBT, LGBTQ plus um, based, then we will see an increase of clients who are not clinging to these shelters where they don't feel wanted or they don't feel like they belong. Um, and they can have a space where they, they can actually you know, have the resources to, to get the housing and have the resources to get the funding for housing. And um, there's just so much that we could do if we had more inclusive spaces for these individuals. Um, yeah, and, then, and I'll say that for now. And then if anything else I have to say pops up, I'll jump in again. So if anybody wants to take over now. Uh, Shaplay Brooks, I am the executive director of the Mass Commission on LGBTQ Youth. Thank you for this hearing and thank you for having us. Um, I just have a few points and happy to answer any questions as well. Um, so the Mass Commission on LGBTQ Youth, we put out a report every single year. That is what we are commissioned to do. Um, and homelessness is, um, is one of the major, our core areas that we speak about. Um, and my goal here today is just to kind of give some um, background on how we came to the conclusions that we came to, especially in our 2025 report. Um, I think it's important to note that transitioned age youth, um, and those are our youth anywhere between 18 and 22, right? That's that transition age. And I would say, I would argue it's even a little bit older than that. My son is 21 and still calls me to make a dentist appointment for him. So that is um, definitely, um, we need to think about that. But I would say that many transitioned age youth have interfaced with one or more of the following agencies before and after their 18th birthday. Those agencies are DCF, DMH, DYS, DDS, and ORI. Um, and I would say that many of the many of BIPOC LGBTQ youth, as well as immigrant and refugee and asylum seeking youth, have significant additional barriers, um, access to resources, advocacy on their behalf, um, education, and support because of their marginalized identities. LGBTQ youth are facing um, are facing or currently experiencing homelessness because there is simultaneously not enough housing and the lack of the rent cap in Massachusetts um, is 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 an is an issue. Um, the astronomical cost of housing in the Boston city limits. I know that we all <laughs> um, deal with that. Um, but for a, a youth, um, a young person, it is significantly harder, right? Um, even in a co-op housing situation, um, to keep up with that. Um, one of the other issues that I wanted to alert us to is the balance of state or your continuums of care. 
um, they don't really communicate. Um, so when a young person goes to a shelter on one side of Boston um, and they sign into a shelter and then they go into a, a, another shelter on another side of Boston, they can be taken off the list. Um, and so that, that does not give them the access to the vouchers that they need. Um, and so that is an issue and that's a, that's a money issue. Um, that's, not a, that's not a real issue, it's a money issue. Um, just people wanting to reserve their resources um, or preserve their resources. Um, Another thing I'll say is there's a lack of preparation for youth coming out of uh, systems of care. Um, and despite the amount of money that's being dedicated and awarded to these agencies, which also means there's a lack of accountability, there's a lack of vision, and there's a lack of execution. Um, and that is something that we speak heavily on in our report. Um, the lack of preparation includes uh, changes in documentation for LGBTQ youth specifically. Um, when you think of uh, making sure that you have access to get a, an ID that has your correct pronouns listed there or your, your correct gender, excuse me, listed there is important. Um, so we think about that. Dual system involvement between DCF and DYS. Um, I have a thousand other points, but also um, I wanna give the floor to, to my other panelists here. But I think when we think of how this comes about, I think it's important to think of the different systems that each of our youth are, are touching sometimes at the same time. Um, and for LGBTQ specifically, not having the amount of programming, not having the amount of education. Um, and, I'm, and I mean across state systems. Um, we are only one agency. Uh, we provide technical assistance and training to agencies, and um, these recommendations aren't always followed. Um, and so I think that that's important to know, but I'm happy to answer any other questions and give more information soon. I don't want to take up all the time. Aiden, you want to go? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Aiden Seguin. Um, thank you, Councilor Santana, Braden, and Coletta Zapata. Uh, for sponsoring this hearing. Uh, while I recognize that LGBTQ uh, youth homelessness is a far larger issue than any individual or organization can address alone, um, bringing more public attention to this often overlooked issue and population is a crucial step in the process um, of addressing this. Um, again, my name is Aiden Seguin and I'm the guest advocacy director at Y2Y -Y Harvard Square, uh, a seasonal overnight shelter that serves up to 27 young adults between 18 and 24 years old uh, nightly. Um, in addition to providing dinner and breakfast, we offer regular health care services and case management services aimed at creating sustainable pathways outside of, out of homelessness and developing skills for long-term success. What makes our model unique is, that, uh, is the population we serve uh, and our leadership structure. Why do I Harvard Square is the nation's first student-run young adult homeless shelter? Um, our youth-to-youth -youth model empowers young adults through collective support allowing guests and student staff to lift each other up through shared understanding, transforming empathy into a bridge of trust. Um, to preface before sharing some statistics about our guests in the past two seasons, that's the summer and winter, um, I want to inform the committee that these numbers merely describe our shelter and cannot in their current state be mapped onto uh, the greater population in Boston and Cambridge. That said, at least 36% of guests who completed intake did not identify as straight. Um, and at least 20% did not identify themselves as cisgender. These numbers include those who declined to answer and exclude those uncomfortable divulging said information, um, but still highlight the diverse sexual orientations and gender identities of the young adults staying at Y2Y. As the Director of Guest Advocacy, I looked both at feedback given directly to staff in weekly meetings and exit surveys to build the following testimony for this hearing. When asked, for things that Y2Y does well, many guests who stayed with us mentioned the environment of inclusion, non-judgment, and mutual respect. Other guests emphasized that being among peers their age contributed to this sense of community and safety. In this way, Y2Y strives to create a space where people can come together in spite of differences instead of catering to one specific demographic in this age group. On the other hand, when asked for places where Y2Y -Y could improve, guests expressed frustration at the lack of available beds each night and resources during the day, a frustration that is hard to hear, with our cap of 27 seasonal beds existing largely for reasons outside of our control. Our allied programs, Youth on Fire, More Than Words, Bridge, and Liberty Village, to name a few, help cover the need year round, but evidently the greater Boston community is still failing this population. To end, I want to call attention to the guiding framework held since the inception of Y2Y, positive youth development. This, con this concept encapsulates the fostering of important skills and encouraging the involvement of youth in their communities. 
In the spirit of this framework, further outreach to those experiencing homelessness themselves should be a priority of this committee, in spite of and due to the barriers that such outreach presents. Thank you very much, uh, panel, for that testimony. Appreciate it. Uh, oh, there's still one more, right? Yeah. Forgot, absolutely. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Connor Schoen. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Break Time. Um, two of our incredible associates uh, presented earlier, sharing their story. And to share a little bit about my story, I started Break Time when I was 19, which was seven years ago. Um, and I was in my own process of coming out when I learned that 40% of young people experiencing homelessness identify as LGBTQ+. Um, so this is an issue that matters immensely to me and to everyone on this panel, and an issue that's disproportionately affecting our um, LGBTQ plus young people. To talk a little bit about Break Time's model, for those of you who are not familiar, we work to equip young people with the job and financial security they need to attain housing security. So as you hear about Bridge Over Troubled Waters, Y to Y, and other programs, we are the partner that works on the job and financial side to really provide that wraparound support um, so that together we can ensure that young people have everything they need to succeed. Um, just to tell you a little bit more specifically about our model, we have a three-part model. It starts with three weeks of job training, financial literacy, and life skills training. That's called Launchpad. That lays the foundation for young people to succeed. Then we have a three-month job placement program called Liftoff. We actually pay young people to work at um, uh, workforce partners all across the city, from healthcare institutions to early education. Um, as Brianna mentioned, we also have paid GED placements where you can work to get your uh, high set or your high, you can complete the high school equivalency test uh, and get paid $20 an hour to do that. So lift off that three month period is where you get paid to either work or do an educational placement. Uh, and then finally, Stable Orbit is three years of continued wraparound support including $100 a month for three years to all of our alumni. Um, and opportunities like this, paid opportunities to, to, to testify, to share your story, um, to participate in different um, uh, flight booster programs that we have. We also match savings that people put aside and we provide credit counseling. So again, break time's focus is really on the job and financial side. We work with about 300 young people a year um, and a lot of them are from the city of Boston. We're based currently by North Station, just like a five minute walk from here. Um, but we actually just purchased a building in downtown Boston. We're gonna be expanding our programs and services. Uh, we're calling it the hub for solving young adult homelessness. I invite all of you to come check it out once we uh, do our groundbreaking on November 14th. Uh, basically, it will have space for our staff. It'll have space for all of our job training programming and case management. We'll have a resource hub floor where we have washers and dryers, showers, donated food and clothing, and other basic needs supports so that young people both in Break Time's program and those interested can access some things that can help them right away, even though a lot of the skills that we coach are things that help you for the long term. We want you to leave with something that's helpful today. Uh, and then the rest of the building will be leasing out to partners to use to support young people in other ways. Uh, we actually want to use the basement space for shelter. So that's one way that we're hoping to work together with the city and with, with other partners. Um, and hope to get an opportunity to talk with all of you more about that project. To conclude, I just wanted to make three recommendations uh, with the time I have left. So first, for an organization like Break Time that's working to support young people but isn't a direct housing or shelter provider, it's very hard to navigate the city funding because there's sort of we sort of stretch across a lot of different departments, and therefore it's really hard to gather the funding we need to do our work. Um, the Youth Development Fund has been really helpful as a flexible source of funding. I think that that should be expanded. I think it's a great way to invest. Um, or another way to invest directly in solving young adult homelessness. There needs to be that flexible funding to provide uh, opportunities for full comprehensive wraparound supports and the types of services young people need. And real quick, um, City agencies should be making direct referrals to break time. So if you go to breaktime.org slash youth, very easy link, you can either refer or apply uh, to break time's program. And so I want everyone across the city to be knowledgeable about it. So for any agencies you work with, um, make sure that link is bookmarked. Uh, and if anyone is curious to see our work in person, learn more, always happy to give a tour. So thank you.
Thank you very much, panel. Uh, and don't worry about the screaming. That's by far the least screaming that's occurred in these chambers before, <laughs> so we're, we're very accustomed to that. Um, I'll now turn it over uh, to my colleagues uh, for questions. We'll have four minutes uh, each for questioning. Uh, and uh, That's question and answers uh, from you guys. Uh, and uh, we will start with uh, Councillor Santana as a sponsor. <laughs> Councillor Santana, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you for our panelists uh, for being here and, and, and providing the testimony. Um, and Aiden and I actually you know, really appreciated you, your testimony. Um, I'm a big supporter of Y2Y. Um, the, your co-founder, Sam Greenberg, and I, uh, or Sam Greenberg, and, um, know, I know him very well, and I remember when it, um, I used to work for Phyllis Brooks House Association. So when it first opened, I was there. My brother was also working there. So I'm a big, big fan of the work that you all do. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, Director Brooks. Um, really appreciated your testimony. Um, you know, the, the commission and FY25 report is focused on state level policies. Um, though it does reference some of the items, um, some of the items that Boston is um, actually doing um, well um, and opportunities for improvement. What are your policy recommendations for the city of Boston to better address the LGBTQ plus youth and young adult homelessness? That's a great question. Um, I would say, um, I think Connor has given a couple, right, when it comes to some of the resources and allocating those resources. Um, I think it's really about advocacy in the city of Boston, especially around, like I said, with the continuums of care in Boston. Um, the fact that, to me, I think it's, it's, it's not something that you can readily change, but it, that you can ask those questions um, of the COCs, of continuums of care, of the balance of state. Why is it that a, a youth can go to Cambridge, maybe to Y to Y, and then they go to the other side of the city, and then it, that's an issue? Um, that's one recommendation. I think the city of Boston um, is is doing is what you can, right, with what you have. But I think it's advocating on a on a on a higher level um, with the state to figure out what funding could come to the city of Boston. Um, you also have to think about ways in which you can help young people um, and their dual diagnoses, right? Um, I think that's really important and making sure that the programming within Boston is more of a wraparound, program, wraparound services for young people um, instead of this kind of like one-stop shop in many places. I'm thankful for places like Break Time and um, even, even y to y has expanded its programming. So that's great, we're great for that. We're grateful for that. But I think um, as far as some of the, sh the shelters in the city um, need to be dedicated for LGBTQ youth and need to be trained specifically around um, trans-identified youth um, and their experiences. Um, and I would say those are the recommendations off the top of my head that I can come up with. Well, wow, great. Thank you, Director. Uh, I'm going to ask two more questions. I'm just going to read both of them into the record. I know my time will probably be up very soon. Um, so for any of the panelists here, um, when experts discuss ending homelessness, they often explain that that would mean um, making homelessness, you know, quote unquote, rare, brief, non reoccurring. Um, what would it take for us to make LGBTQ plus youth and young adult homelessness rare, brief, and non occurring here in the city of Boston? Um, so that's the first question. And my second question is actually um, for, for Eli. Um, you mentioned, you know, whenever someone will, comes to your floor, they feel welcomed and they feel loved. Can you speak to that a little bit more? What actually goes into that um, so that way? we can also learn about how we can implement those things, um, implement that feeling in, in all of our spaces, so. Yeah, I think it just starts with um, there. being open to uh, accepting people that you don't necessarily understand. So anybody that walks through the door, I'm not looking to figure out exactly, you know, where they come from or wh what they've been through, but the thing is, is that once you're here, I want you to feel like you're part of this family, um, this big bridge family that extends to Y to Y, that extends to break time, um, because we're all interconnected and we all run across each other at some point. So to take someone off the street and to connect them to us and all these other resources is really more than what I could ask for. Absolutely. I guess my other questions in terms of, sorry, Mr. Sure. Chair. No. What would it take for us to make LGBTQ um, plus youth and young adult homelessness rare, brief, and not reoccurring here in the city of Boston? Yeah, I'm happy to start with that question. So another term we used to refer to that is called functional zero young adult homelessness. So this idea that, you know, it's not that no one is ever spending a night on the street, but it's rare, brief, and non-recurring when it happens. It's the sort of framework we use that 
an organization called Community Solutions coined is functional zero. So that's something we care a lot about at break time and, and trying to be part of making that happen. I think the biggest thing the city can do that I would emphasize is again, flexible pools of funding that support wraparound services for young people. So the biggest challenge I've had over the last seven years is break time has grown from an idea to an organization with 40 full-time staff and a $6 million annual operating budget is the city has not been a significant source of funding for us. You know, people will ask, you know, we're in the city of Boston, we serve the city of Boston, people think the city, people give a lot of credit to the city of Boston for like supporting break time, but frankly we haven't received, probably under 2% of our funding comes from the city of Boston. Um, and I say that not as a critique, but more to illuminate the structural problem that exists with how city funding is distributed to organizations like break time. We have to go to the Office of Workforce Development for a slice of funding to pay for the wages for our young people for job placements. We have to go to um, another office for specifically young people that fit a certain identity category. Then we have to go to another office. And it's like trying to gather a bunch of pennies from couch cushions and then somehow pay for an incredibly expensive but important model. So to end young adult homelessness, we need a flexible pool of funding that organizations can tap in different ways to provide comprehensive services. Because when funding is overly restricted, it doesn't allow our organizations to creatively solve young adult homelessness. And everyone's experience of young adult homelessness, as you saw with the youth speakers today, is different. And so if our funding isn't built in a way that's flexible and can be used in different ways to support young people, then we're not gonna, we're not gonna end young adult homelessness with a one-size-fits-all model. So the example that I can give, and I mentioned earlier, the best funding break time has ever received has been from the Youth Development Fund. And the reason is because it supports a range of things that you can use to support young people. Well, we're really appreciative of grants we've received from, from other programs, and there's some newer grants that we just got, so I can't speak to those, but in the past, historically, other funding we've got, it's been so restricted that we can't holistically support that young person. So funds like the Youth Development Fund, which already exist, I think should be expanded. Or if the city would consider creating a separate fund specifically for young adult homelessness, as long as it's flexible funding, I think that's what's most needed. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. No, absolutely. As the sponsor. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Council President Louis Jen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for everyone who also came for testimony. Um, uh, learned a lot. Um, and I also know that tomorrow is National Coming Out Day, and so it's a time for us to really celebrate um, open spaces for everyone. Um, Connor, question for you. When you talk about flexible funds to support wraparound services, can you talk a little bit about more about what that means for you and your organization? What would that allow you to do in the lives of that young person? Yeah, so again, just as a reminder to everyone, Break Time's mission is around providing job and financial security for young people experiencing housing insecurity. So one of the issues we run into is you know, I'll give a federal funding as an example with HUD, and that trickles down into the state and city. It's usually exclusively for housing. There's very limited support for wraparound support. So if you're a housing provider, you can use some of that for housing, but housing is never successful without wraparound services. So the services break time provides in terms of job training, job placements, match savings program, credit counseling, all these things that are needed to sustain housing, aren't funded through programs that support housing. So what's difficult is we have to go to programs that are designed for a much broader audience, like a workforce development program for workforce development for everyone, and they're not specifically as geared towards young adults experiencing homelessness. So for example, to get a young person stable at a job costs a very different amount of money if they're homeless versus not homeless. So if I go to apply for funding from the Office of Workforce Development, the amount of funding per young person is probably a couple thousand dollars. What it actually costs to stabilize a young person experiencing homelessness is ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So that cost difference is what the problem is, is we don't have enough flexible funding to do all the other things that are going to make a young person successful. And if we just have enough funding to do a little bit, it's not going to permanently address the problem and it creates what we call at break time, the cycle of young adult homelessness, where there's never quite enough support to keep that job, not quite enough employment to keep that housing. 
And so a more, a larger investment per young person is needed through more flexible funding models. Thank you. Um, and can you talk a little bit about, I know Camp has a model of, of, of giving its um, um, participants, I forget what's the word. Associates. Associates. Um, uh, stipends even after, you know, once they're em em employed. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and what's the funding source? I'm a big fan of what, you know, taking the paternalism out of policy and empowering people through stipends, through making sure that people have a basic income. Um, and how are you able to, how are you able to fund that, that work that you do? Yeah, so in each part of our program, all associates are paid. So at the beginning, during Launchpad, the three weeks of training, you get a training stipend that's roughly equivalent to $20 an hour. In, in liftoff, which is the three-month job placement, you're actually paid wages of $20 an hour, and we match any savings you put aside. Finally, in stable orbit, the three years of continued wraparound long-term support, we provide $100 a month for the full three years. So it's $3,600 uh, over the three years. Um, and we fund that predominantly actually exclusively through philanthropic funding. And one of the reasons is that a lot of programs, they're only meant for, say, like the first year a young person is with you. And so you can't get funding again to support them in that second or that third year. But what I will say is that our, we just had the first group of young people complete the full three years, because we started this in October of 2021. And the impact, the delta that that has had on outcomes is tremendous, because Young people are not going to get to a place of stability in three months and three weeks. It's that long-term support that's needed. And that's why funds like the Youth Development Fund and other flexible funding models allow organizations to creatively address these problems. And we know that our stable orbit, our three-year program works. And we'd love for government to be a partner in making it sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Council Braden. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to all the folks who testified already. Um, I'm familiar with break time. I think you did a presentation for us a few years, maybe a couple of years ago, and I'm also bridge over troubled waters. I was at the at the opening the ribbon cutting at the the, the home in uh, in Brighton fairly recently. Mm -hmm. uh, very very exciting. Um, I, I'm I think you're getting to the you know the need for flexible funding. I think so many of the grants that we you're able to apply for are. Uh, not unrestricted. They're very restrictive in their targeted piece. So you, you have a particular set of needs that you're trying to meet and uh, um, a multifaceted package. Um, so I think that takes a, it takes a lot of work. Um, in terms of uh, sources of, of funding, like where, where do you manage to get your funding, for, your funding from? Yeah, so... Um most of our funding is philanthropic, so through foundations and individuals. Um, we get some state funding. We have a state earmark in conjunction with our partner, Bagley. Um, we have contracts with the Department of Public Health, with the Department of Transitional Assistance, um, and a few other agencies. On the city level, um, we're really grateful. We recently partnered with MOLA, which we're really excited about. We've partnered with the Office of Black Male Advancement, the Office of Workforce Development, um, the Youth Development Fund, um, and a few others. And so I think the biggest challenge for us is that been that no one source of funding really is big enough to address the whole picture of all the needs of a young person. Um, and it's really hard and really expensive, frankly, from like a staffing perspective to try to piece together all of these smaller grants. So if if it is through the youth, youth Development Fund, for example, if you put an extra three, four million dollars in that fund, that's a fund that supports Bridge, it supports Break Time, I don't know if it supports Y to Y, but I think we're probably getting twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars from that fund right now. If we were getting a hundred, hundred fifty thousand, even that would have such a big impact because that fund can be used for supporting young people and attaining their financial goals and their employment goals. And so that's the kind of funding that's worked for us. Um, we're really appreciative of all the other funding we get, but having one centralized source for bigger grants that support more wraparound services would be really helpful. Yeah, thank you. And um, I think this is more of a question um, for Ms. Brooks. The, um, 
you know, the, the young people who are aging out of foster care, like, I think it's really almost bizarre that we expect kids to age out of foster care at 18 and they're able to walk out into the world. None of the rest of us walked out of the world at 18 and were self-supporting and knew how things worked. Uh, I think it's really... Uh, is, is there any sense at the state level of other models, other ways of doing this? It was more tra transitional, it's not such a hard stop and on you go, uh, get out and, and do it yourself. Is, is there any, any other models out there that, that uh, would offer a better path? Absolutely. Um, the state of Georgia, so one of the things that I always tell people, I've worked in four separate states um, in DCF offices. Um, as well as having lived experience. I'm a DCF kid. So I understand where the the funding, not the funding, but where the, the programming is and what needs to happen. And there are other models, specifically in the state of Georgia, and one that um, is LGBTQ focused that I think is really um, impactful and powerful. But I also think it's a, um, it's, I can keep, okay. I also think it's a, a there are, it's a multi-level issue, right? Um, it is, you do not have to leave foster care at 18. Um, they have until they're 22. They can they can sign back into foster care, but it is the treatment that they receive while they're there. So when I say it's a multifaceted issue, it really, really is. Um, they can they can leave foster care um, at 18 because they're like, oh, well, I can go to break time and I can get resources from somewhere, somewhere else and then want to come back into care and they can either be denied or they can be kicked out because their worker doesn't like them. <laughs> like they're, they're not doing what their worker told them to do, which most 19, 20, 21 year olds don't. Um, and so I think it's like, it's a multifaceted issue um, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Mejia? Oh, Councilor Mejia is not here. Uh, one, two, Councilor Weber. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, hello. Um, so I had a question. Uh, in terms of starting a shelter, making a new shelter, what are the administrative hurdles here in Boston to doing that? Can anyone answer? Do you want to start, Aiden? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I did not start Y2Y, um, but I, I can speak a little bit about like some of the logistical difficulties. Um, like, I think primarily, at least in my mind, um, one difficulty that like Y2Y addresses by being a student-run shelter is honestly the cost of staff. Um, because during the school year, um, we have very few full-time staff members supporting a primarily volunteer-based um, student staff. Um, and so I think I have an estimate of how much money that saves. Um, it might take me a second to pull that up. But just that initial hurdle, as well as training and maintaining a staff um, of any amount of size, and as we talked about, making sure that they're competent on these different issues that affect youth specifically, um, it, it's a large toll. And like it takes someone that I think either is willing to put in a lot of time to understand the nuances of this age demographic and or someone that's already worked in or has experienced this to kind of bring that perspective. I don't know, Connor. Yeah, yeah, and if you could just also, I, I don't, I, who do you need to get permits from, you know, that, yeah. that kind of thing. I'm just, I'm not familiar with. Yeah, so permits. zoning is probably the number one hurdle, especially when we look at trying to do something downtown where Break Time's new building is. We have, our basement space is about 4,500 square feet and already has two showers in it, which is really unique, and has a kitchen in it. So it would actually not be that expensive to renovate into shelter relative to other spaces, but it would be very expensive and time consuming to rezone for shelter use unless we have some creative partnership with the city to make that easier. Um, so I think zoning is the number one hurdle. Um, we're looking into it now, like in terms of what it would take, but we're trying to get a better sense of you know, how to actually make that, like, speed that along so it's more, more easy. And the second thing I would say is, you know, to Aiden's point, capacity to actually run it. Break time, you know, we're experts in providing job and financial security and wraparound support to young adults experiencing homelessness. We're not experts in providing shelter. So we're happy to provide the space. We're happy to provide support to all the young people in the space. But having the operational partner, whether it's another organization here or someone else, to actually run it. Is a, is a hurdle from for us to making it happen. Okay, yeah, it's a, you have to go before, like, do you need the city, uh, you have to go before the BPDA or something to open 
to open a new shelter space, I, you know, do you, do you have to get a zoning variance? It is a special oh, the zoning. The state, the state helps with that? I don't, do you have any? Well, I don't, I, I don't work for the executive office of housing and livable communities, but yes, the state <laughs> definitely um, can assist and, and are willing um, in our conversations um, with EOHLC. They are like we we one need a space. We need some people, and you tell us where and who wants to do it, and we'll put, and we'll help put that together. So that's one of the things we were speaking about before that. But on the city level, there is special a special zoning variance yeah. for shelter. So, I, I, and I think it's I guess through inspectional services department. I know y'all are better experts at <laughs> the city than me, but I believe it's through there. So if the if the state's on board and the city's on board, if there's a way we can mitigate how much the administrative hurdle is back up the process, that would be great. Um, and then uh, I, I know uh, on the, if there's a second panel, uh, there's the someone, from, yeah. someone from BPS, but uh, my question was, you know, in terms of you know, uh, people who need shelter, are you seeing kids from Boston Public Schools? Uh, and you know, do you care to talk about that? Yeah, the outreach department. I Bridge over troubled waters. Um, I know that uh, the supervisor, Shamika, she leads a lot of events. Um, and she just recently, not too long ago, was at Madison Park um, High. And that's one of the one of the bigger schools in um, Boston. And she was advocating for our shelter, um, letting them know that if they knew anyone that was you know, scared to come out, because a lot of it <clears throat> is around them being young and insecure. And, about the things that they're going through, so they're not going to always speak up. So um, just advocating and getting out there in the schools and making ourselves visible um, is what we try to do to get even more. Yeah, because uh, we we, we've, we've heard statistics. It's something like over 5,000 BPS kids experienced homelessness just in the last year. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I was just wondering what you're seeing. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, um, I can say. Uh, like Y2Y -Y definitely works with um, BPS students. Like on, I don't have the statistics on how many um, exactly, but um, a lot of come, a lot come to us. Like, like towards that end stage of high school, we start um, allowing people to come at the age of 18, um, and so there's like a very small like overlap with that age demographic of usually like seniors or people that are um, just been in school for a little bit longer. And so I've, I've personally worked with um, different referrals from BPS, like counselors, um, in our lottery system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Council. Council Pepe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to start off by thanking the sponsors of this hearing because it's a very, it's a very important topic and one that, you know, we really have to have in this chamber. So I'm also thankful for the panelists that we have here today. It was very, very um, not refreshing, but it's just rewarding to to hear about the work you're doing and to get to know a little bit about yourselves. My first question is a little bit. I want to take it back a bit. Um, I want to understand why is it that why is the percentage of homeless youth um, in terms of who identify as LGBTQ so high? Um, are they homeless by themselves? Are they homeless with their families? Um, is it because they're getting kicked out at home? I just want to understand the core of what we're talking about today. You definitely said it. You definitely said it. Um, they're being kicked out of their homes. Um, but also, I think it's, and I'm going to very quickly, important to note when I say that not only are they kicked out of their homes, but they may be in foster care, they may be in DYS, they, all of those systems, um, it has become just kind of like an ever-flowing faucet to, to homelessness, if that makes sense. It's, it is quite literally people going from care to homelessness. Okay. okay, and getting kicked out of your house in general is traumatizing. Um, I can imagine being kicked out of your home from a young age is probably even more traumatizing because you have nothing to depend on. I know that, um, hearing a little bit about your testimony, you said you worked on helping youth get jobs or just understand how to career a career path is organizations that support with like mental health and to um, any specific social services in regards to that. I'm a big mental health 
proponent. So I just want to know if there's specific organizations doing that type of work as well. Yeah, at Bridge Over Troubled Waters, um, we have different floors for different reasons. So we have about six floors at our main facility. Um, the sixth floor is rapid rehousing. The fifth floor is education and job security. Um, the fourth floor is um, intake, um, so anyone that's coming in for the first time into Bridge, they would go up there. Third floor is a residential program. Um, the second floor is the day program slash the welcome center, which is the overnight shelter. And then the first floor is just like, you know, when you come in, they greet you and everything. So um, I'm sorry, the initial question again, one more time. Uh, do you, like, is there a specific um, resources for mental health? So for the mental health, we also, on the fourth floor where they do intake, we have therapy. Um, we just recently hired even more therapists because there was like a slight drought for a little while. But now we just recently hired some new ones, so we're able to, you know, uh, refer more clients to therapy, um, which is great because we see so many times that they're severely affected by uh, things that they've been through in the past um, that they're still traumatized by, but they don't, they didn't have the resources to get the help that they need. So it's great to be able to refer a client who's coming in or who's been there for a while who was a little um, hesitant about therapy, but once they, you know, opened up and got to see what Bridge is like and feels more comfortable, they're a little bit more open to receiving therapy and mental health, health services, whether we have to get in contact with DMH or mm -hmm. find an outside source that can help us with each individual case. Um, I can also speak to this. Um, just within our space, uh, every single week we have a clinic with Boston Healthcare for the Homelesses, uh, like family uh, team, and they have a licensed therapist that comes in um, and speaks with our guests as well as a representative from Department of Mental Health also comes in on a regular basis. Um, so both of those organizations and offices, I guess, um, are definitely invested in like this age population and I would definitely say that a strong provider would be Boston Healthcare for the Homelesses family team. Okay. Yeah. Again, just thank you so much for the work you all are doing. Um, this has been very educational for me to be able to, to know what's out there for anyone that may need resources. So I want to make sure I continue taking notes and learning a, little, a lot more. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and finally, we're on to uh, Councillor Coletta Zapata. And my apologies to Councillor Weber, Pepin, and Zapata for not identifying you guys when you first sat down. But um, you're obviously here now. Councillor, on to you. Thank you, Chair. And I apologize that I've been going back and forth. We had a hearing before this, and I, I wanted to make sure I had some sustenance to be able to ask some, some great questions and be fully um, involved in the conversation. So I appreciate you all being here for your patience with today. Um, and thank you for your work, too. Um, it just, it, it really does break my heart to think about, and I've been trying not to get emotional because um, I can only sympathize, but kids that are homeless because they've been kicked out for who they are. And we live in Massachusetts, right? And, and this, is, um, this is still an issue here, clearly, because we're having this conversation. But to think nationwide what kids are going through, everyone deserves a safe and stable home, and they deserve to feel loved in that home. Um, and that's, that's my guiding light. And so, you know, as we're having this conversation, I, in, in listening to my colleagues' questions, it's always good for, for me to understand what the opportunities are. And I, I'll use the term gaps, like what are the gaps? What can we be doing? I think I can summarize it in, you know, what, what aren't we doing as a council, as a city, that we should be doing? We, we do have some members of the administration here, but, um, Knowing that we're all working together, I'm always curious to know what can we be doing better? Um, because this is clearly a crisis and we're doing it for these kids. And I think any individual who has lost a home because of who they are is one too many. So I'm just curious to know if you have any feedback or any initial thoughts. Yeah, I'm happy to, to start. Thank you so much for the question. I'll start by saying I have had, I could not think of a better uh, a group of people to work with than the folks I've had the privilege of working with at the city, from MOLA to the city council to offices all around to the mayor's office. Um, we are so privileged to live in a city where people care about this issue and they want to solve it. And so the issue, at least from my perspective, is certainly not buy and certainly not care. We all want to get this done. For me, it comes down to funding, which is something that we all collectively have to solve and no one in this room has full control over. Um, 
we're talking about mental health needs, we're talking about employment needs, we're talking about housing needs, shelter needs. If we don't have a flexible pool of funding that can address all of those things, if we don't have that funding to point to when an organization comes to one of your offices or comes to one of you city councilors, then we just can't collectively solve these problems. And so I think that's the gap. Uh, again, I'm so thankful for you know ev everyone here that I've had the privilege of working with at the city. Um, and I wish we all together had a flexible pool of funding that we could pull from to creatively solve these problems so that all these recommendations that we're sharing, we can all say, yeah, we can do that because mm -hmm. we have the funding. So I think it starts with the budget. I think the budget, city budget's the most important policy document that you all produce. And so as we think about next budget year, um, or even creative uses of remaining ARPA funds that haven't been um, uh, committed to certain uses, that's really, for me, where the gap is. And thank you so much again to everyone here who I've had the privilege of working with. Um, I would say also um, that gray area where um, we're finally able to connect a client with housing, but you know, having them sustain that housing is mm -hmm. like another issue that I see. Um, so I feel like more emphasis or training in that area, um, whether it's uh, how to keep a job, professionalism, which I know break time does and everything, but like for the amount of the population that we work with, it's just not enough. Thank you. Anybody has anything else to add? You're okay? Okay. Um, well, I appreciate those answers. Uh, and I, I really do. Usually I, I don't like the premise of, of the question I'm about to ask. But in this instance, it's good to understand like what we should be striving for. So it's the magic wand question. If you had a, a magic wand and you had all the funding in the world and some of these issues were resolved, um, what would be the model um, service that we have for folks or the model home or whatever it is? I, I, I would love to understand what that might look like. Um, I'd love to speak. Um... I had the privilege of visiting um, Pine Street um, this summer as part of the Why Do I staff was trying to see just more of the landscape across Boston and their case management services with uh, representatives for contacting different um, landlords as well as different housing projects and trying to make that human connection and link was just like impressive. Their statistics for like getting people into long-term housing um, are like great but at the same time, as we heard from testimony and just across the panel, the demographic that we serve do not feel comfortable going to those larger shelters. They don't feel like welcomed or safe in those places. And so by not staying at those places, they don't have access to those type of case management services um, where those long-term relationships are already in place. So mm -hmm. my magic wand would be to like have a branch of one of those larger, more established more established shelters that could utilize the like professional case management services there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do have um, one other question. Just thinking about funding and the need for flexible funding, where is f philanthropy in this space? And also where is the, the business community with their social giving programs? Are there anywhere? Yeah, so we, I mean, over 85% of our funding comes from philanthropy, uh, from foundations, from corporate foundations, from individuals. So um, they are currently the flexible funding pool okay. to support this work. So, uh, but it only goes so far and there's, there, there's only so much of it and it's only reliable for so long. Um, and so we'd love to be able to diversify our revenue and have more from government. That's a big goal of ours as we think about our plan for working together to and young adult homelessness. Um, so so we're, we're fortunate to have the support we do and we, we would love for the city to be a bigger part of supporting our work. Um, and just to quickly reference the last question, one thing I'll, I'll add is that when I'm talking about the Young People Break Time Serves, I'm specifically talking about 18 to 24 year olds. I just thought I would state that since we each kind of work with different age groups. Um, and honestly, in an ideal world with a magic wand, we could s sustain our programs to be preventative. A lot of people ask me, like, if young adult homelessness reaches functional zero, does break time still have a role to play? And the answer is absolutely. 
but that role would be completely preventative, preventing young people from reaching homelessness by providing job and financial security. And so if I think we, if we can get to that point and sustain this work to be a preventative mechanism, that's my magic wand uh, spell that I would cast. Thank you so much. I know that's my time. Thank you, Chair. Um, most of my questions have been answered through the other questions of my, my colleagues. Uh, but one thing I was wondering is, for the folks that testified today, right, a lot of them were out of state, and I've gone to bridge over troubled waters before, too, and they had folks present there, and they were out of state. Is there, is there like a, is there something about Boston that would attract, is it the, the atmosphere or services that we provide and the welcoming that, as, as we are as a city and a state, that people are coming here because they are attracted, or is that just sort of a, a theme that maybe I've picked up on that it is not necessarily sustainable, it just happened to be like, well, John, you just saw a lot of out-of-state people. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if it is a trend where if you live in the South and you get kicked out, you, you're saying to yourself, well, I know where I have to go. Yeah, I think there is a pattern with that. It's usually between Boston and New York. So I've seen, because I'll ask clients, I'm like, well, why did you come up here? And they're like, well, I don't know. I was thinking about New York. So I hear New York a lot, and I just think that, um, I don't know if it's through social media or through their own personal experience of speaking with people, but I know that people choose Boston because it is safer. Um, realistically, for people who are LGBTQ+, plus, um, for me, right, my lived experience, I can walk down the street in Boston and express myself the way that I want to, right? Um, clients that I have, I have two clients from Tennessee, you know, uh, the neighborhood found out that they were LGBTQ+, LGBTQ plus somewhere in that spectrum and then they came to their house with guns and you know because that's allowed you know open carry in certain states so it's just it's very scary for them not to know um, what the next day is going to be like or if they're going to be able to see the next day when you have so many different threats from people who don't understand your lifestyle granted because you know this the state as a whole is this way or that way but when you come to Boston it's a little bit more open it's a little bit more free and I think people know that um, I, don't, I just don't know exactly where they're getting the information, but they know that, and it's enough for me to see the pattern, too, that you noticed, and they come here because they, they feel like they can maybe be themselves a little bit more. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a shame that those who... Uh, well, it's great that those fleeing from their houses that, are, you know, that have to leave will come here because they feel safe. It's a shame that we can't show those causing them to flee to come up here and say... It's not that bad, guys. <laughs> right? Like, let's roll yeah. um, So with that, uh, I thank this panel very much. Uh, you guys are relieved, and I appreciate all your testimony, and we'll be moving on to the next panel. But thank you so much for coming out and sharing your education yeah. with us. Thank you. Great. Uh, with that, we will call up uh, panel number two, uh, testifying on behalf of the administration. Uh, Pedro Cruz, Executive Director of Office of Youth Engagement and Advancement. Katie Cahill-Holloway, Acting Director of Supporting, uh, Supportive Housing in the Mayor's Office of Housing, and uh, Yahara Batista, Senior Housing Development Officer, uh, Supportive Housing Division in the Mayor's Office of Housing. Uh, if those folks uh, are here, they are welcome to join us up front. And I know... Uh, the individual from BPS uh, could not make it with us today due to an illness. So there will not be our folks from BPS. Um, panel, welcome. How are you? How are you? Very good, very good. Thank you for, uh, for being here and providing your time. I think we heard a lot about um, uh, what those, these, the youth on the street are feeling, and we'd like to know what uh, we as a city are doing, and of course, uh, how we can, I think a lot of the, the conversation there was talking about the gaps in service, and we know whether from just ho regular, overall homelessness, addiction, uh, youth homelessness, uh, there always seems to be a gap that might cause us to kind of feel like we're in the hamster wheel of, right, we can get them to a certain spot, part and not over the hump. Um, so we'd love to learn what we are doing and, and, uh, and how we can help address those gaps as well. Um, so I don't know in no particular order. Uh, look, ladies first, or do you like to go if you guys have a certain order? Did you have to go first? I'll go first. I, I, I thought he had a hard stop. No, 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 no. We, we, I can okay. go first. Pedro, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Yeah, um, hi everyone, so I really do appreciate this space and I just want to kind of start off by just really 
start off by sharing the vision of the of my office. So it's about a year and a half old. So we are brand new into in, in City Hall, and really our goal has been to support what we've coined the three levels of youth work, which is the youth organizations and the spaces created for young people, whether that's libraries, schools, youth programs, community centers, um, youth workers, which is adults that work in those spaces and, and create relationships with young people, and then young people themselves. So all the work that we do is to really support those three levels of youth work and really answer the question as to what does youth work look like through City Hall. So with that, in terms of this specific population, the way that we've been supporting that is through multiple initiatives that we have. Um, the first one is our Mayor's Youth Council. So we've been very intentional about revamping that program and really making sure that the uh, Mayor's Youth Council represent the much larger population of, of young people, so we've definitely been trying to make sure that we're inclusive with um, the participants that we're selecting on that, and again, that they represent the much larger population. Um, the second is through our Youth Lead to Change, which is the participatory budgeting program that we oversee. It's actually the first participatory budgeting program for youth in the nation. We're going on the 10th year, um, and we're, again, making sure that we get to any programs that have the LGBTQ population to make sure that their voices are included in that participatory budget and program. The third initiative I'll share is our youth line. We actually just launched this over this summer. Um, and we I know we all in City Hall have heard how City Hall is resource rich, connection poor. So there's a lot of resources and opportunities in City Hall and across the city, but it's difficult enough for an adult to navigate that and who do I talk to, where do I go to? So that fear is amplified for young people. So we created what we call the youth line, which is that my team identified over 400 resources and opportunities for young people. We created an online dashboard that's real user friendly to use and just kind of filter the um, resources you're using for. And we also have a community face and desk. So in case they don't want to use the technology, they can come to our desk at the Tobin Community Center and get direct connection to resources through my team. Um, we also have the Mayor's Youth Summit, which was the first one. We did the first one last year after 20 years. Um, we worked closely with the Office of LGBTQ Advancement to make sure that that space was going to be inclusive for the LGBTQ community. And we also had over 20 events that we did leading up to the summit that week. We also worked with the Office of LGBTQ Advancement to make sure that we had spaces created around the city specifically for the LGBTQ community. Um, the other one I would share is our professional development series, which is how we support the adults in the field. So we make, um, we identify professional and development opportunities from October to June. Last season, we did over 30. We just launched this next series, and we work closely again with the Office of LGBTQ Advancement to make sure that we bring proper training to the adults in the field that work with LGBTQ youth. And again, we make this training accessible and completely free to organizations. Um, and then the last thing I would mention on our end is the Youth Needs Assessment Survey, which is something we're working on right now to launch within the next month. Um, and it's going to be focused on the 14 to 25 year old population, specifically on what they need when they're not in school, when they're not at work. And we're really excited about the survey because this is going to give us raw data around what young people need and we're designing it in a way that we're going to be able to filter the results and be able to tell the Office of LGBTQ Advancement what it is that LGBTQ need. And the same is going to apply for all the other offices, Immigrant Advancement, Black Men Advancement. But we're really excited and we've also worked with the Office of LGBTQ advancement on that to make sure that our, the questions are appropriate, that we're asking the right questions, um, and that we also get it out to that community specifically. Great. Thank you very much, Pedro. No problem. Thank you. Okay. I'm up. Um, good afternoon. My name is Katie Cahill Holloway. I use the She, Her series, and I serve as acting director for the Supportive Housing Division at the Mayor's Office of Housing. And with me today is Jahira Batista, who is a senior development officer for the Initiative to End Youth Homelessness in Boston. And we are really thankful for the opportunity to update the council on the work the Mayor's Office of Housing is doing to address the needs of LGBTQ plus youth who are experiencing housing instability and homelessness in the city of Boston. Um, so we want to thank you for having us here, um, Councillor Satana and Braden and Coletta Zapata, and for bringing um, this important issue to full attention, and also the Committee on Public Health, Homelessness, and Recovery for scheduling the hearing. Um, and I 
want to thank all members of the City Council, those that are not here as well, um, for the unwavering support that you lend to the Mayor's Office of Housing, working to assist our most vulnerable neighbors in obtaining and maintaining affordable housing. Um, so the Mayor's Office of Housing has worked really intentionally to address the issue of youth homelessness since the launch of Rising to the Challenge, which is Boston's plan to prevent and end young adult homelessness, and this was in November of 2019. The plan focuses on inclusivity and centers on creating safe, stable, and affirming housing for all youth, particularly vulnerable groups such as LBGTQ plus youth who experience homelessness at a disproportionately high rate. MOH was able to compete for significant resources through HUD's Homeless Demonstration Grant Funding Opportunity, and Boston was selected as a YHDB community in early 2019. And since that time, we've received annual renewal of that funding, totaling nearly $10 million. The YHDP portfolio supports a variety of housing resources and youth-informed supportive services to ensure long-term stabilization in housing. MOH partners with several youth service providers to administer the programs, including Bridge Over Troubled Waters, The Home for Little Wanderers, JRI, and ESAC. And this resource represents over $2.9 million annually in funding and provides housing and affirming services to approximately 320 vulnerable youth each year. Additionally, the City Council has allocated 2030 funds to directly support young Bostonians experiencing homelessness, for which we are super grateful. These city investments include the creation of a youth flex fund to cover one-time housing related costs to ensure that financial barriers are minimized for all youth, particularly those from marginalized backgrounds. This funding has also created a youth peer housing navigation program, which was established to provide tailored support for young people to access housing and services, and it emphasizes the importance of peer connections in fostering trust and understanding also, we created with this funding a youth liaison position to support the needs of youth at larger shelters such as 112 Southampton and Woods Mullen to foster an inclusive environment that specifically addresses the needs of LGBTQ plus among the broader population. We also recognize the importance of youth voice in designing resources and systems to support them, and MOH has created uh, the Boston COC Youth Council, which is the BCYC, and it's an advisory council of youth with the lived experience of homelessness, including LGBTQ plus voices, to guide policies and procedures and ensure that services are equitable and responsive to the needs of all youth. And as a result of these investments and partnerships, MOH has tracked a steady decrease in the youth population experiencing homelessness, as demonstrated by the annual point in time count. When the city initiated Rising to the Challenge in 2019, the number of youth identified as experiencing homelessness was 157, and in 2024, that number had dropped to 132, which is a decrease of about 16%. Additionally, 621 young people have been housed out of shelters or off the streets since the initiation of the plan, and to date only 6% of those youth returned to homelessness since the inception of the plan. We recognize, however, that one young person experiencing homelessness in our city is one too many, and that certain subgroups such as LGBTQ+, are particularly at risk. So we continue to compete for resources that provide safe housing and trauma-informed services. Last year, as part of MOH's annual continuum of care application to HUD, we were awarded a project that will provide emergency housing with an on-ramp to rapid rehousing targeted specifically to LGBTQ plus youth experiencing homelessness. This is sponsored by Victory Programs, and this program is slated to start operations later this calendar year, and it will support approximately 12 LGBTQ plus youth in accessing housing. And this is just some of the work that MOH is doing to support young people, particularly those that are marginalized and experiencing homelessness. Um, and we thank you for your time and attention and support and are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so thank much. You. I'm part of that. I no. am <laughs> Jahaira Bautista. I use the she and pronouns. And I oversee and work with all the providers in all these programs that have been created by the city and, you know, hearing all the challenges, successes um, that young, young adults and youth are facing um, is part of my work and what I, you know, strive to do every day to see what else we can do to help um, youth out of homelessness. Great. 
Well, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your time. And as a former Mayor's Youth Council alum and former MC of the uh, the Mayor's Youth Summit, I'm glad to see that it's back. I think they stopped it after I emceed it, and with good reason. Um, so I'm glad to see it's back uh, with a fresh face. Uh, we're going to give three minutes each for the rest of us here as it gets later in the day. I will start with uh, the sponsor, Council Santana. The floor is yours, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and I um, appreciate our panelists being here. Really. Um, Great to hear about all the work that you're all doing. Um, I'll get right into it. Um, Katie, you know, I mean, you, you, uh, I really appreciated your statement. Um, can you just speak more? And, and, and I think you, you, at the end, you spoke directly about you know what you're doing to, with, um, for our LGBTQ plus community um, for housing. I think your most of your statement was talking about just housing in general for our youth. Right now, I mean, I, I filed this here order because right, uh, housing is a human right and everyone deserves it and I, all our youth deserve it. But we're seeing numbers with our LGBTQ plus community at alar like alarming rates, right? So can you just speak to what we're, what we're doing with BPS specifically and in your office with BPS and, and, the, and the homelessness that we're seeing um, with our LGBTQ um, lots of public school students? Sure. I'm probably going to let Jahira yeah. speak a little bit more to this, um, but I know for BPS we have um, identified liaisons in each of the schools that um, youth and, and young people that are experiencing housing instability and their families can approach to get connected to the Mayor's Office of Housing or to the um, Office of Housing Stability through the Mayor's Office of Housing. But you yeah. might know. I, I want to be yeah. clear. I mean, I pre again, I. I care about all of our youth. For, for today's discussion, I, I really want to focus on our LGBTQ plus youth and see what we're doing and, you know, with our BPS population there, if we are doing anything specifically. Specifically for LGBTQ plus in BPS, I'm not 100% sure. We are seeing um, a large number of BPS students that are facing homelessness. There are, I don't have the numbers with me today. I did pull a report though that it showed it was approximately in fiscal year, in last year, around 39 youth um, accessed our BPS rapid rehousing program through the B, um, BPS peer navigation program. That I don't have the numbers of of those 39, how many were LGBTQ plus? Um, and they also do self-certify that. So the data that we have, I can submit after, but I don't have it with me right now. Oh, that would be great. Thank you so much, Aida. Um, my last question here, you know, we heard from our first um, panelists, I mean, about, you know, wraparound services, the need for, I mean, for more, more shelter. Um, can, can any of you speak to you know what what we're doing here in the city of Boston of, of making that happen, making that a possibility of, of, of creating this you know more shelter for our LGBTQ plus community um, and, and, and you know our safe spaces as well, not just necessarily housing, but creating safe spaces. Can we? What are we doing on that front? Um, hi, I know for me I can speak towards one of the so one of the things I've been trying to do since I took leadership of the office is really catch up with this participatory budget and program. Right, one of the challenges is the implementation component. Right, we we collect ideas and certify them every year, but implementation takes more than a year. One thing I could do, and I'm going to owe you more information on, but I'm. 100% sure that one of our winners in the last two, three years, um, the money was allocated towards a shelter. I'm not sure if it was LGBTQ specific, but I know that we did fund towards um, youth shelters in Boston, but, uh, but I definitely would love to come back to you with more information. And again, and I think just the participatory budget and program alone is a great way to get young people involved and to actually what they need. Great, no, thank you again so much. For, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Council Santana. Council Weber. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess you know, when we're looking at the budget, like what, what, where would we see the funding that you're uh, using um, to help LGBTQ plus youth? So you're specifically wondering about the, the city investments? Yes. Yeah, so I think it is under the Housing 2030 line item, um, and it's the Youth Flex Fund, it's the... Um, There's approximately six, seven, no, I'll say six rapid rehousing programs, um, and also the BPS 
um, Youth Navigator, a uh, BPHC Youth Navigator as well. Um, and these, are, these two positions or programs serve as point um, places for youth to go if they are experiencing homelessness to get assessed um, to be put in a pool of housing programs. Okay, uh, and, and I guess, um, so I mean, one, one concern when people go into shelter is that we, we don't plan for a longer term and get them into housing that they can stay in longer term. And when you hear the length of stays in shelters, it's just mm -hmm. people spend years. And, and it, um, so I guess what are, what are we doing for people who go, who take advantage of these things? And maybe the rapid rehousing deals with this, but mm -hmm. what, what are we doing to get people into, you know, um, some, something more permanent once they go in into shelter? Sure, I can say that we do have a couple of permanent supportive housing programs. They're, for youth, they're not a lot. There is very minimal. We do have um, approximately 240-ish rapid rehousing programs and a transitional housing program as well to um, exit youth out of um, shelters quickly but it's not enough it's there's still there's still some need for it for that mm -hmm. and then would they be going in uh, how, what, how would they be paying for housing Did they get section 8 city housing voucher do we do we have housing that we provide or do we are we getting them into uh, some private housing sure so the rapid rehousing term um, works as um, short term and medium term rental assistance so they so I work with the organizations that are funded for these program and they provide the rental assistance and the case management but it is like I said short term it's 24 months okay and is that is that raft is it no. no, it's not RAFT. Um, there are some city-funded RAPID programs that Jahira is talking about. Then we also have some HUD-funded ones. Um, and RAPID rehousing, you know, is meant to be short to medium term. So um, rental assistance can be provided for up to 24 months and then ongoing services for another six. Um, and when somebody's enrolled in rapid rehousing, what should be happening is that case manager is looking to plan for like, okay, what comes after rapid? And a lot of the times they'll be applying to different wait lists. Um, if there is um, a disability that's involved, then they might be eligible to transition to permanent supportive housing. Um, but, you know, there's also the hope that if you're in rapid rehousing and you know you can work with an organization like break time and you can increase your income you know you might be able to get to a point where you can sustain it might be shared housing you might have roommates um, but you might be able to get to that level of independence um, with your housing okay and just last question uh, the, the case manager who, who, who does the case manager work for where are they are they in the Office of Housing? Or? No, no. So these would be with the youth-specific providers, so like bridge case management. So when we fund a RAPID program, um, there is assistance there for the rental assistance and then also um, dollars to provide that case management. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Council Weber, thank you very much. Uh, Council Coletta Spada. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your work. Uh, it's good to see you all. I had a lot of my questions for BPS, so maybe I can send them in, since no, no, no one's here from BPS, right? right. Yeah. Okay. All right. A lot of my questions are for them. I do just want to give a quick shout out to East Boston High School's um, homeless liaison who does um, the Lord's work, my mother, Nina Gata Coletta, and she uh, has really informed me of, of what some of the gaps are, and which is why I had a lot of questions and comments, um, but I don't have anything uh, for you all right now, um, or sorry, for... Um, Excuse me, I do have some questions for you. I'm sorry, it's been a long day, please excuse me. So, um, talking about housing in particular, so the City of Boston uh, voucher program is a brand new thing that was funded. Do you all oversee that program at all? I understand that that sets aside some of these vouchers for BPS families who are going through homelessness. Does any of that come through your shop at all or is that just solely B BHA? Is this, I, I think it, it's, it's with Where? BHA, right? Is it BHA um, or is it higher ground? No, it is through 
That one is the for youth, the okay. foster youth to independence. Foster youth to independence. Yeah. And it is for youth that um, have some foster care involvement and that are exiting that system. Mm -hmm. They are assisted through ABCD for housing s navigation and housing services. Okay. I do think that, and that's good to know because I didn't know about that. I think the one that I'm referencing um, is different. So I might submit questions for BHA where this is like a, a set aside pot of money for families in, in BPS that are going through homelessness. But then at what point are these kids homeless because of their parents, because mm -hmm. they've kicked them out because of their, yeah, who, yeah. The, who they are mm -hmm. and, and, right. and, and who they love, which I think is yeah. awful. Um, so I'd be curious to understand how they uh, approach that. Um, I think maybe for the purposes of this conversation, uh, Pedro, you are um, engaged with youth all the time. I'm curious to know uh, what sort of training you've gotten from the city of Boston, seeing that kids come to you in a, in a third space where they should feel loved and safe. And I asked the same question of Martha Rivera. Um, when she's hiring executive directors, how do I know that the new executive director or, or existing executive director and city of Boston staff are not going to um, demonstrate their biases, right? Everybody's gonna be treated fairly, and then if a kid is coming to them in crisis, what tools do they have to make sure that they're adequately supported? So, I'm curious to know what training you've, you've gotten from the city. Yeah, no, for sure, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm actually happy you asked. So, before I even took on this role in leadership, I've, I've taken numerous professional development opportunities, all from the Public Health Commission, to different other agencies, everything from working with um, trauma youth to also LGBTQ youth, and we've also um, we've also participated in our own professional development series that we launched last year, which included working with um, LGBTQ homeless youth and working mm -hmm. with LGBTQ youth. So me and my team, I've made sure that the professional development wasn't only extended to partners, but to make sure that my team was also well equipped, um, as long as um, as well as with myself. And we've also been working very closely with the Office of LGBTQ Advancement since the launch of our office to make sure that they're included. And, and I'll give you even a perfect example. Uh, we've helped um, my office and their office has helped um, Boys and Girls Club launch what we call SULI, which is the state of our LGBTQ youth. And it's an ongoing monthly meeting of LGBTQ-focused organizations that gather up to continue the work with the city. And one of the first things I did when I joined there was really call myself out, because I am a straight identifying male in this room. And I made sure that that's when we tapped in the Office of LGBTQ Advancement as our partners, because I, I continuously check myself in the spaces that I'm walking in to make sure that if I'm not the expert that we bring in the experts to really talk to um, to really lead those conversations so um, so that's what we've done in terms of making sure that myself and my team and others are equipped and then again and we are extending those professional developments not not just to organizations and partners but even city officials and and, and city departments that work with young people over the summer because that's one thing that I've been able to identify that we take in a lot of interns mm -hmm in the summer and there's a lot of people in city hall that never really been trained to work with a young person so we've also extended those services and those opportunities for them as well yeah and what one would hope that all city workers would have the same sort of emotional intelligence and self-awareness that you have but i think we can fairly say that some don't and so that's why i think continuous education on that would be would be useful um so thank you for outlining that that's all i have thank you thank you Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and with that, I understand that there's no further public testimony, as we also did take testimony at the beginning of this hearing. Um, and so uh, we'll forgo closing remarks in the event that it has been a long day, especially in the chamber here, uh, and we all have other things to attend to and get back to the great work that you all are doing. So I thank the, the panels uh, for their continued work in this, in this field. Uh, and this hearing on docket number 1001 is adjourned. Thank you, Councillors.